For decades, governments, international institutions and global corporations have been privatizing public resources and selling nationally owned industries off into private hands. The neoliberal agenda was supposed to make our lives better, but in 2020, cities around the world face record levels of homelessness and global income inequality has soared to an all-time high. So much you know. What you less often hear is the other side of the story. I've spent much of the last 20 years reporting on people and projects that provide an alternative, and sometimes these days, that looks like deprivatization. In just the last decade, more than 2,400 cities in 58 countries have brought privatized resources back under public control. In late 2019, I went to Amsterdam to attend The Future is Public, a gathering of hundreds of organizers, scholars, and elected officials who reject the idea that private is always better. If the future is indeed public, these may just be the people who will bring that future about in cities and towns across the world. My report's coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the show where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The movement towards public ownership is happening at a critical time. Climate change requires that societies change, but we're already stretched to a breaking point. In conditions like this, it's easy for right-wing politicians and movements to take advantage of people's desperation. Can new models of public ownership provide a way for societies to cohere, to come together, and to provide quality public services and housing and health care and food and water for everyone? That's the question. Are we at a tipping point? To find out more about the Future is Public conference, I've come to speak with Fiona Dove, the longtime director of TNI, the Transnational Institute, a research and advocacy group based in Amsterdam that is co-hosting the conference. We met between sessions in Taiba Mosque, one of the two venues for the event in Amsterdam's Bilnimir neighborhood, home to immigrants from over 150 countries. If you look back to, to the roots of, of the networks that are at the core of this conference, they got together to say, let's not focus on describing the anti-privatization struggles, let's focus on the alternatives that people are putting into practice now. So if you were to describe a beginning of the story around remunicipalizing or putting things into public hands, putting public power into public hands, where would this beginning of the story be for you? I think the beginning would be Chile 1973 uh, and certainly the beginning for TNI because that's when we started dealing with uh, the questions of privatization and all the pillars of neoliberalism as, as uh, uh, it's come to be known. So the coup in Chile was a neoliberal coup. It was uh, Pinochet came in with the help of the Chicago boys and experimented. Uh, Chile was a laboratory for, for neoliberalism. And there's a kind of poetry in now seeing the uprising in, in Chile today, which uh, has been a long time coming. Um, but we're hoping that that's also symbolic of the final collapse of this paradigm. So what's uh, changed? What's happening now is the sense that we've reached that tipping point where it's absolutely clear that it's not in the public interest to, to privatize all social services. It's, it's no longer a discussion. The private sector can never deliver public services because there isn't sufficient profit in it. And you can't cut off, in, in modern society, certainly not, you can't cut off the majority of the population from public services. Water is Life has become a rallying cry in communities around the world, from the Standing Rock Reservation in North America to the cold, dry highlands of Bolivia. In Lagos, Nigeria, the African continent's largest city, millions of people struggle to have clean water, while the local government threatens to sell the water supply. Akinbode Oluwafemi is an organizer with Nigeria's Environmental Rights Action Group. 
He helped launch a movement against the PPPs, or private-public partnerships, that his city's notoriously corrupt government has favored as a way to cut costs and make money off Lagos's infrastructure and resources. We knew that multinational water Corporation saw Lagos as the entry post into Nigeria and into Africa. So if we stop them in Lagos, we'll stop them in Nigeria and we'll stop them in Africa. We don't want Africa as a playground of failed development models around the world. So we need to organize our people and resist them. And that's exactly what we're doing. What is the relationship between the neoliberal model, neoliberalism, privatization, and corruption. In Africa, most PPP arrangements, these, these, these corporations come in with their beautiful PowerPoints, with their portfolio, and then they come to government, they sign an agreement to take over this infrastructure. Governments give them a bond to go to our local banks again to borrow money. They don't even bring in the money. And when they fail, the government, our people, are then made to pay this. This is scam. This is fraud. That's what it is. And we're saying, no, we can't allow this to happen in the water sector because we need water to stay alive and that water should be democratically controlled by our people. That's exactly the reason why we started to resist PPP or privatization in Lagos and in Nigeria. What do you think made people so receptive to protest this time? So, so let me be very specific. I'll talk about water. So I'm African. So there's cultural rights to water. Water is communally owned. So we, we do have this attachment. I grew up in the village. And so you have rules that guide how we use water. And specifically, when you sit down to unpack those rules, you find out that our ancestors realized that this is a common world that must be protected for this generation and generation unborn. So you, you are not allowed to unduly uh, exploit those resources for your profit or for anything. So I now moved to the city and was shocked. I was culturally shocked to see how privatization, commercialization is taking over the water sector rather than you know the principle of protecting it for the common good. And then you then study further and you then see you know, those hidden hand of these multinationals who originally will give what they call grants or ODAs, but ultimately they're using it to, pro to you know, pro promote the entry of their private companies. What we think is that water as a right should be left in the hands of the people. What happened and what did you do? We brought together labor unions, women, youths, market women, community leaders, everybody into what we call our water rights campaign. And we basically go back to the old school model of organizing, sit-outs, protests, rallies, petitions, banners, everything that we can have. Community meetings, we sit down under the tree, we sit down anywhere that's available. Women sat down on the roads and they said, you've got to listen to us. We are the one that suffered the brunt of acute shortage of water in Lagos. We are the ones that trek kilometers to go look for water to care for our kids and to care for our loved ones. Where does the situation yeah, stand I mean, now? We started in 2014. This is 2019. They've not been able to conclude any contract. I mean, even the World Bank itself acknowledged the fact that the environment for PPP in Lagos is very toxic in their own document, which like the biggest acknowledgement of our works that we've ever gotten. And uh, the people keep organizing. The interesting thing is, look, this movement is like a seed. It's now growing national. I mean, from what we started in Lagos, our water right movement now has started in Jos, in Plateau State. It has started in uh, Makod, in, in Bauchi, that's another state. And uh, it's moving gradually into the National Assembly in Nigeria, where people now are now organizing for government to enforce and enshrine the principle of the right to water in Nigerian constitution. If the movement in Nigeria succeeds in changing that country's constitution in order to keep water in public hands, it will be following in the footsteps of Vienna, Austria, where public ownership's been the norm for a century. Renata Brauner is Vienna's executive city councillor, and she came to Amsterdam to share the story of how her city created one of the highest standards of living in the world and a desirable business hub by robustly funding and defending 
public infrastructure like housing, healthcare and education. It dates back to the 20s and 30s of the last century, the famous Red Vienna. Um, Vienna in this time was as huge as is it now again. And uh, the, the, the framework, the, the, the situation of the people was desperate, very, very bad conditions. People were ill. Some of the illnesses even had the name Viennese disease because so many, especially kids, were ill. And when the Social Democrats came in power, uh, in Vienna, the first thing they said was we have to have good uh, housing uh, for the people. Uh, the, the saying in this time was uh, light and sun for the children. And um, so they started uh, with the famous Gemeindebauten, which means publicly owned uh, flats. And we still have 220,000 of these uh, city-owned flats. Uh, and we have uh, additionally 200,000 of flats uh, from non-profit organizations, also publicly subsidized. And who lives in those flats? Is it just poor people? No, not at all. That's very important. Two-thirds of the Viennese people live in one of these types of uh, flats. And uh, internationally, we're very often asked, does this mean the people are poor? No, not at all. Uh, our idea is that housing is a human right, and therefore we also want to include the middle class uh, in this uh, housing policy. And uh, we are very often criticized by the neoliberals, by the conservatives. You are influencing the so-called uh, free market. Well, that's true. That's exactly what we want. Because we believe housing is a human right and shouldn't be only organized by the private market. And to be honest, uh, Vienna is known as the capital of music, the capital of culture. But uh, more and more in the last years, um, people realized that uh, Vienna is a top in all the rankings concerning our quality of life. Like and I have to admit, I'm very proud of this. We are um, Mercer study, 10 time in a row, number one. The Economist uh, ranked us number one with the uh, quality of life. And uh, when you look uh, behind these uh, uh, rankings, when you look at the criteria, you can see this is very much because of the good working infrastructure. What has all of that got to do with public ownership? Well, when you look at all those things, many of them are publicly owned. The transport system uh, is part of the Wiener Stadtwerke, our Vienna utility uh, public company. The energy system is uh, owned by the city and uh, we are fighting to defend these publicly owned uh, companies. The water supply is publicly owned. We even made some years ago a law which pa is part of the Viennese constitution because we think uh, that water, uh, to have a, a, a clear and, and affordable and healthy water is a human right. Uh, from the conservatives there have been many attempts for privatization um, but the big majority of the Viennese supports our way. We had a, um, a referendum some years ago uh, and we asked the people, do you want to privatize water, energy, housing? And 89% uh, said, no, please protect our public services. Vienna is unfortunately a rare case, even in Europe. London stands in stark contrast. In the 1980s, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's government encouraged local governments to cut public payrolls and hire private companies instead. All these years on, there are some signs that that sort of Thatcherism has run its course. Asima Sheikh is a city councillor from the London borough of Islington, where she and her Labour Party colleagues have been ending outsourcing and rehiring public workers. So tell us a little bit about, about growing up, the environment that you were coming up in and, and what it was that got you to join the Labour Party. I joined the Labour Party in the 1980s. During the miners' strike in 1984, it was a major strike um, in, in the UK. Um, it was under Margaret Thatcher, under the Cold War and under Ronald Reagan. I had a great interest in, in international politics, but the thing that motivated me to join the Labour Party was Th Thatcher's attempt to break the unions. And I remember as a 16-year-old standing outside my local supermarket collecting tins of food for the miners. So fast forward to now, yeah. um, what's your job, what do you do and what are you up against? What are the challenges you face? So I'm an elected Labour councillor for the London Borough of Islington. I represent a ward called Finsbury Park Ward. Um, Jeremy Corbyn is my MP and I'm his local councillor. For Islington, I'm the Cabinet Member for Inclusive Economy and Jobs. 
We came into power as a Labour administration in 2010 and we came in on a manifesto that recognised that Islington, even though it's in the centre of London and it's thought to be quite affluent, it's a place of stark inequalities. We've got some of the wealthiest people that live in our borough, but we've got the highest rate of child poverty in London. So we were very much determined to come in and to improve services for local residents. We recognised that a lot of our services had been outsourced to the private sector. And we came in with the promise that we would bring services back in-house because they just weren't delivering for local people. Give us an example. So the first thing that we did was to bring back in-house our cleaning services. It's a small, small number of staff, but it was really important. They, they cleaned for us in the town hall and they weren't being paid the London living wage. So we became a London living wage employer and we were delighted to bring back our cleaning services in-house and we could pay our workers the London living wage. That's quite a small contract, but we had a number of large contracts. So our housing management services, we're a large landlord. We provide public housing um, to residents. Uh, we brought back in quite a large contract, about 20 million or more so. I think I probably got that number wrong. I can go and check. Um, we brought back in our housing services. Um, then we brought back on our education services and also our refuse and street cleaning. What that has done, is two things. Firstly, we're actually improving services. Residents weren't getting a good quality service under those providers. They are getting a better quality service and are more responsive and more democratic. They can hold us to account. And also, we're bringing back employees that we can give them good employment conditions and pay them the London living wage. Now, isn't this super expensive? It is, but actually, we are making savings because it is more efficient. Um, it actually costs more to outsource to a private company because they have to make a profit and they have to pay their shareholders. We don't do that. We can plough the resources back into making a better and more improved service and um, making sure that we can pay the London living wage. So does that mean Thatcherism is dead, neoliberalism over? form of neoliberalism at the moment um, is run its course and I think it's been under attack quite consistently from a number of uh, different sources. I would like to think that Thatcherism, I mean, I think Thatcherism is definitely dead, it, but what Thatcherism manifested will reshape itself. And that's the challenge. And I think that the only way that we can challenge that is for a strong public sector. I would love it if we, um, if, if national government doesn't do it, what's fantastic about this conference and this experience has been the action that's happening at the city level. I mean, you don't need to wait for national government. Why don't we together as cities and municipalities get together to build a really strong local public sector and we find our ways of fighting back um, on the manif present manifestations of Thatcher. Even small municipal initiatives can and do spread. In Chile, where the so-called free market principles were first applied, the collective memory of the US-backed Pinochet dictatorship cuts deep, as do the ramifications of decades of neoliberalism. In 2019, public anger boiled over when hard-pressed students revolted against a transportation price hike a sustained and national rebellion against austerity rocked Chile's political establishment, forcing leaders to back down. Rodrigo Hurtado Osbar is executive director of the Open University of Recoleta, a free university in the city of Recoleta in Chile's Santiago metropolitan region. He came to the Future is Public conference as the representative of Recoleta's mayor, Daniel Hadua, who has not only worked to open a free university, but also a free medical pharmacy in town. Yadua's work municipalizing education and drugs has come to serve as a model for what cities and the national government can do to meet public needs in a public way. Rodrigo, you grew up in Chile in the wake of the coup of 1973. Can you tell us a little bit about those times? Por mi edad posiblemente pertenezco a la última generación de chilenos que conserva recuerdos personales tanto del gobierno de la Unidad Popular, presidido por el presidente Salvador Allende, como de la dictadura de Pinochet 
que abarcó un periodo, como ustedes bien saben, de 17 años y que forzosamente marcó la vida de todos los chilenos. Se va constatando en distintos planos de la vida precisamente la huella del proyecto político que empezamos a comprender representaba la dictadura. Y había huellas en todas partes, en la educación, en la salud, en la forma de relacionarse, en cómo se organizan las ciudades, incluso espacial, territorialmente, porque Chile presenta una altísima segregación territorial, eh, que definitivamente consagra las, de, las diferencias de clase de la sociedad chilena. What happened to education especially? A la fecha, esa obra de desconstrucción de lo público se puede situar en un porcentaje del 85% en manos privadas a nivel de la educación superior y alrededor del 70-72% en el caso de la educación escolar. What were the roots of the university, the municipal university? What was the birth of it? La Universidad Popular de Recoleta es una iniciativa de su alcalde, Daniel Jadwe, un alcalde que eh, ha logrado saltar del nivel local a la escena nacional, producto de una gestión ya de siete años al frente del municipio de Recoleta, que le ha granjeado el reconocimiento público transversal de la gestión más innovadora, eh, sobre todo en su capacidad de ofrecer soluciones alternativas efectivas a un conjunto de cuestiones críticas para la población. El éxito de esa iniciativa yo creo que le comunicó confianza a una visión política que responde al programa de su partido, el Partido Comunista de Chile, y donde el elemento fundamental es la, cap la capacidad técnica, eh, la capacidad de gestionar políticamente ideas innovadoras, pero inspirado en un programa del partido al que pertenece el alcalde. Y en ese sentido la universidad como tantas otras realizaciones, la inmobiliaria popular, la óptica popular, el centro audiológico popular, la librería popular, que te darás cuenta aborda reglones fundamentales para el desarrollo de las personas, en todos los casos se han sostenido en el tiempo, ya te contaba que han sido imitados por muchas otras comunas y va sentando las bases para poder imaginar pronto, esperamos, una alternativa política válida al neoliberalismo desde la izquierda en Chile. What has changed for the children of Recoleta? A ver, se ha recuperado en buena medida eh, la educación pública para ello. Sin ir más lejos, la universidad funciona en un liceo emblemático de la comuna, un liceo muy antiguo de, de todo Santiago, de todo Chile, llamado Valentín Letelier, que es el ejemplo del abandono en que encontró esta alcaldía la educación pública en Recoleta de manos de la administración anterior que por muchos años estuvo eh, dominada por la UDI, el partido del pinochetismo en Chile. Ese liceo estaba prácticamente destruido, es enorme, tenía poco más de 100 alumnos al momento de asumir su primer mandato el alcalde Jadwe y hoy tiene cerca de mil alumnos de una multitud de nacionalidades eh, porque Recoleta históricamente ha acogido a la población migrante y eh, no solo hay mejoras en la infraestructura que aloja el proceso educativo sino desde luego un reforzamiento muy fuerte de la acción docente de los recursos didácticos eh, al servicio, puestos al servicio de la enseñanza. Si tu pregunta apunta a si el neoliberalismo está herido de muerte en este minuto en Chile, abrigamos la esperanza de que sí. Y esa esperanza se funda en una rebelión popular transversal que ha movilizado a millones de chilenos, lo que le otorga una legitimidad política total, que se sostiene ya por más de 40 días, que ha sido reprimido brutalmente como ya lo consignan distintos informes de organizaciones internacionales de derechos humanos, pero que resiste y que va en, con el correr de los días consolidando, concretando en un petitorio, en un programa de demandas cada vez más consistente que le equilibra las demandas políticas con las de origen social y económico y que puede seguir sosteniendo en el tiempo esta lucha porque lo que está en disputa es si la salida es por el statu quo, por la derecha, o si se sale a través de un proyecto progresista que eh, retome, por qué no decirlo, las banderas del allendismo en Chile.
sinceramente pensamos que Recoleta hace siete años adelantó el Chile que hoy día es reclamado en las calles por todo el país. Porque precisamente a través de estas iniciativas innovadoras que he compartido con ustedes, intentó abordar una solución por fuera del mercado a cuestiones fundamentales para la vida de las personas. Y pensamos que tanto es así que en buena medida esa acción señera explica que en Recoleta, comparado con otras comunas, incluso vecinas, la violencia ha sido sustantivamente menor y entendemos que eso refleja la comprensión de los vecinos de Recoleta de contar con un gobierno que ya venía entendiendo de forma pionera hacia dónde había que moverse como país. From Austria to Chile, Lagos to London, all sorts of people are frustrated with the way things are and looking for new ideas. The people I met in Amsterdam aren't interested in old, failed models, but after decades of experimenting with privatizing just about everything from water to media and education, they are taking a fresh look at public ownership. If you have examples of fresh approaches to thorny problems where you live, I'd love to hear about them. The future can't be public without public input now. Until next time, I'm Laura Flanders.